wake up. Stop setting a potato team in your league to make your whole league think that you're dog water. In this video, we're going to show you how to make the most optimal lineup. Let's get it. There are steps that you can take each and every week to ensure that you are starting the most optimal lineup. It's far from you just looking at who scored the most points last week. It goes way more in depth than that. We're going to break down all types of things you can go over to set yourself apart for the whole league. We're going to go ahead and start going over the basics of what a high floor is and a high ceiling. Let's start going over that. For a quarterback, it's always a plus when there is a high rushing floor. Quarterbacks who can usually go over those 40 plus rushing yards, that gives you an amazing floor that you want to achieve. This is especially the case if you play in leagues where it is only four points for a passing touchdown and six points for a rushing touchdown. If a quarterback likes to run, chances are he will have rushing touchdowns. Then you want to look at having a high passing floor. This means you need to ask yourself, does he consistently throw for 250 yards week in and week out? Well, having a quarterback who doesn't hit the 250 yard mark will not be good for your fantasy lineups. Lastly, you need to look at the quarterback's ceiling. Does he have the potential to throw for 350 passing yards? Having those weak winning games is a difference maker. For a running back, you want to try to have your RB1 at the 14 plus touches a game mark. These are the backs that you usually find the most success with fantasy football. You need to have opportunities, whether it be on the ground or through the air to score points. Even a back with 10 carries and four receptions will put up a good baseline stat for you week in and week out. In today's game, there aren't too many 20 plus carry running backs, so you need to find those dual threat backs. Next, let's look at the running back who has that high rushing floor, because that's gonna be ideal. I would say those who run for at least or around 75 yards on a consistent basis is what you need. Then start to look at if they have the potential of a high ceiling. I would say around 120 yards rushing would be a great ceiling to shoot for. Running backs are scarce and those elite ones are hard to come by. So finding these backs to fill out this lineup is key. Sometimes you need to just find some role players who play on passing downs as your RB2. Now for a wide receiver, getting guys that consistently can give you those seven plus targets a game is key. Seven plus targets is telling me that you should be utilized because you're a part of the game plan each week. Now that we can see that they're being targeted, let's see if they have a high receiving floor of about 75 yards receiving consistently. Having seven plus targets a game is great, but if you're getting seven receptions for 30 yards, you're going to get very frustrated quite a bit. You know, we need to find that consistency. Then we need to look at for that high receiving potential. Ask yourself, can this receiver get me around 120 yards receiving? These are the players that we need to shoot for. Having the potential of having a ceiling game doesn't make them a quote unquote boom or bust player because they have the consistency of such a high floor. Now for a tight end, the reception requirement should be a little bit lower than a wide receiver. I would say getting someone around the five plus receiving targets a game, that's what you need to shoot for. Those tight ends giving you one or two targets a game will more than likely be under five fantasy points a week and that's no bueno. A good consistent receiving floor for a tight end should be around 50 yards. Tight ends giving you this type of consistency will help you not lose your weeks, but only kind of enhance them. The tight end receiving ceiling potential should be at 100 yards receiving. Quite often you see tight ends over that century mark and those are the ones you need to target. The next thing we need to do is look at the injuries. So if you have a backup running back and the starting running back is either down on injury, that's somebody you can plug and play and all of a sudden he's got a lot of more volume. He's not gonna be really splitting carries with the third round back as much, but if he's given all the touches that not only he normally gets per game, now he's got all the touches for the running back that plays all the time, that's somebody that you can see an increased volume. You could see those 14 plus carries a game. That's what you wanna look for. 
Same thing with the wide receivers. Let's look at it. Is the slot receiver injured? Will the is the outside receiver uh, injured? Things like that you need to look at. Also, injuries on the defensive side. Is the nickel cornerback, is the number one cornerback injured? If you have a slot wide receiver, is the outside linebacker injured? Is the middle linebacker injured? There's a lot of things that you can look at on the injury side to best prepare you every single week to make sure you're making the best play possible. Now you need to try to predict the game plan of the offense. If you guys can know how they're going to try to attack you, are they a good run defense? Are they a good pass defense? Are you known to have a running back and a very good run offense with not a very good pass uh, offense, which means they're probably going to hone in more on stop of the run. Look at their total defenses. If they're top five total defense and stop of the run, they're probably going to start focusing on the run. Now, don't get me saying what I'm not saying here. If you have your studs, you start your studs right but other than that if you're on the fence about two players or even a flex position maybe your rb2 spot these are some things you can look at another thing you want to look at is the weather if they're playing in the dome obviously you don't have anything to worry about but there's a lot of fields out there who play in, in inclement weather whether it's rain or whether it's snow if it's raining or snowing it, they're probably not going to pass the ball it's going to be more of a running game so you want to attack the running backs that are playing in rain you want to stay away from the quarterbacks and the receivers who are playing in rain. Things like that is something you need to take in consideration when you're setting your lineups. So let's go ahead and play a game. Let's say that you're deciding from two closely ranked tight ends, and I'm not sure who I want to start. When looking at the defense tight end number one is going against, you can see that they're allowing 400 passing yards per game to their opponents. Now, the defense that the tight end number two is going against are allowing 350 yards passing per game on their opponents. I need you to put down in the comments below which tight end that you would start out of these two, just knowing the scenario now. I'm going to give you a few minutes as I pull this back up to kind of leave a comment. All right. Now I'm sure most of you probably chose tight end number one, just due to the fact that the defense is allowing 400 yards passing per game, as opposed to the other defense allowing only 350 yards passing a game. But so let's dive a little bit deeper to see if you change your mind on the decision that you made on which tight end to, to start based on some more information that I can give you just by diving a little bit deeper. Now we can see, yes, tight end number one is going up against a defense that's giving up 400 yards passing as a whole, but 350 of those yards go to wide receivers and only 50 yards they're averaging throwing to the tight end position. Tight end number two is going up against a defense that's giving up 350 yards passing as a whole, but 200 of those yards are going to go to wide receivers and 150 of those yards are being allowed to the tight end position. The answer here now is clearly tight end number two. You don't want to just stop looking at defenses based on total yards. You want to look at what they're given per position. Just the things you need to think about when going back and forth and trying to decide on what type of lineup you want to put together. Don't just look at the broad kind of range of, of stats and numbers. Dig deep and see what you can find. Now let's dive a little bit deeper into who you should be putting in your flex position. These are positions that I really like to put my boom or bust player. Now, I know we touched on boom or bust a little bit earlier, but let's go ahead and define what a boom and bust player is. A boom and bust player has a very low floor and a very high ceiling, right? Earlier we were talking about, it's not really a boom or bust if they have a high ceiling, but a high floor because they're giving you that consistency. A boom or bust player is gonna be able to give you anywhere between, you know, two, three, four, five points but also can give you those 25 to 30 point type of games if they're known for hitting like those 75 yard catches for touchdowns. That's the boomer bust player. These are the guys you wanna look at for putting in your flex position. The reasoning behind that is you wanna have your main positions giving you that constant floor, but the way you win your games is you're gonna want those boom games, right? So if you can find those uh, flex players that are gonna give you those boom games, it could give you the opportunity to steal a win from somebody you normally wouldn't even take a win from. The deeper you dig, the more clarity that you're going to get. Don't just look for players at a superficial level. Always be willing to go as deep as possible when setting your lineups. If this is your first time here, my channel is dedicated to helping you dominate your league. So if you're not subscribed yet, hit that subscribe button. Other than that, we'll see you guys on the next video. We'll see you guys next time.